Somebody help me out. Good for you and I. Do I win this? The worst panel of the conference? Excellent. So today, what he just said about immutable data structures, Mr. Robert, is something I'm going to ask you to think about how can you apply that to the UI. The UI in this case being a JavaScript web development based environment. Thinking about how can you program using data structures that do not change, that does not get updated in place. Sounds weird? Yes. What can you do with it? Better question. So today we'll be playing chess. We start out with a chessboard like that. Now think about how would you model this. If you were doing this in the UI and the server were, were sending you updates of the board now needs to look like this, the board now needs to look like that, the board now needs to look like that. How would you be modeling this, more or less? Some multi-array with something in the array and then you would render that multi-array in some shape or form, okay? Cool? Okay, so that's our starting position. Very next question becomes, please move E2 to E4. And that's what your board looks like. So now you've taken your data structure and you've changed E2 to E4. And that pawn has now moved. And then the server asks, please move D7 to D6. And now you've updated your data structure and that's what it looks like now. You just render it. And D2 to D4 and it's what it looks like now. Except, no, all of that's a lie. Because the way that you visualize that from left to right, keeping all the states in your mind while I was telling, talking to you, is not the way you would actually do it. You would start like that, multi-dimensional array. Then you would get a question, you would destructively update your array. And then you would get a question, you would update it again. Then you would a question, you would update it again. You will not keep the previous boards around, right? You would physically change the board every single time. So that's easy because that's your current state and that's your move list. That's the list of moves that has happened, okay? Now I ask, whoa, what happened at move two? Can we go back there? How? How would you undo the moves? Okay, so if your back button works, you're a better JavaScript developer than I am. So how would you get back there? You could take the moves and reverse them. Is that true? Yeah. Assuming you've sorted them, yes. Okay, so that's your move list. I've given you the move list. I have that. Can I reverse them? Okay. And assuming that a move didn't take off a piece of the board. Assuming a move didn't take a piece of the board. If you just reverse those steps and you've actually taken a piece, you cannot get back to the original position. So I was a bit aspress here because there's better ways to actually notate these things that will give you a notation that you can actually reverse. But this is a <coughs> metaphor and a model, so work with me. So I've given you a situation in which it's impossible to get back to the previous state. Okay? So what would you like to do instead? Keep all the states. What you would like to do is, you have a starting position board like that, then you go to the next move, then you go to the next move, and then you go to the next move. 
and you keep all those chessboards in your UI, in your JavaScript memory management, in your browser. Is that a good idea? Why not? It's not, but tell me why not. <laughs> You're limited in the amount of memory that's allocated to JavaScript. Limited amount of memory allocated to JavaScript. Now this is the magic moment. If you're using Closure Script to do this, every single update, every single update, that little move is all memory that you will use extra to the board. So the only thing you would record is the change in the board. The way that Closure Script data structures work is pretty much like it. It has a version, it has a new version, it has a new version. And all it saves is the increments between those versions. And it's done extremely and exceedingly effectively. Now what the garbage collector does is if you're only holding onto the last board, if you only have a reference to the last board, the three at the back would just go away. We'd get garbage collected. <coughs> However, if you do want to keep the full history, all you need to do is keep a reference to all four states. Put all four states or the references to those four states in an array and you have them. Now this makes for some interesting, uh, interesting optimization things where you could actually have the partial history. So what if I only want to keep the last 10 moves? If you only want to keep the last 10 moves, literally, only keep the last 10 moves. Make a, a buffered reader and you're fine. Surprising? Too easy? Leave me? Doubts? I'd like my audience to actually interact at this point. <laughs> okay, cool. There's this awesome framework called react.js. We have seen it. Cool. Facebook, Facebook library. Uh, I, don't, I think the name React was badly chosen. It's nothing more or less, nothing to do with reactive programming. And it basically works like that. We have a developer, mostly a person. And we have a machine on the right side. What I hate, absolutely hate, about any JavaScript framework out there right now is that it assumes that the developer or the person is a machine. It assumes that the developer has to keep track in their mind what the DOM looks like and has to actually work with the DOM. What React does is draws a very strict line between the user and the machine. Let the user do the fun stuff let the machine do the boring stuff. It does this in this way. You have a virtual DOM. What this means is as a developer, all you're doing every single time that you render is you completely paint your DOM from the root, the whole thing, every single step. You say, make the DOM look like this ignoring what it actually looks like. Just look like this. I want you to look like this. Then the machine figures out how to do that. So the developer continuously draws a new virtual DOM. Continuously. From scratch. Draws a new one. And then the machine who knows request animation frame? It's an HTML5 lifecycle step where the browser actually says, the browser is now going into a, a rendering phase. Who is ready to render something? And when the browser asks that question, then and then only does React.js take whatever you have in the virtual DOM right now and by magic, make it look like the virtual DOM. So how do you think they do that? Tree diffing. 
So what they do during the request animation frame step is they look at the real DOM, they look at your virtual DOM, and they run from the root and they do a diff on every node going all the way down. They find a nice diff and they take that diff and they apply it to the real DOM. Why has nobody thought of this before? <laughs> I think it's the coolest thing ever. Now, the Reactor JS, because it has to work with the mutable data world where you could have changed the nodes while they're working on it, they actually have to do content diffing. So they actually have to diff every single node based on the actual content of that node, which is inefficient, as you can imagine. Still very, very fast, but mostly inefficient. What Closure script allows you to do is doing a reference equality check. That's it. If this node is in that tree and this node is in that tree, reference equality, excellent. If not, new node. But having immutable data structures like that, it speeds up Reactor.js about six times in certain cases. Right. So typically when we work on UI work, we have state and we render that state, right? Get state from somewhere, the world. The world says now be like this, move E2 to E4. Changes the state and we render that state, okay? Typically we have some logic, at least, that says okay, to render this state, use this logic to render that thing. Now, where it gets interesting with closure script and with closure in, in, in general, is that is your only notion of time. Around that little box of state, that's the only place and the only time that you actually think about where you are in time. Rendering has no concept of time. Logic has no concept of time. No concept of where we are in any way, in any way in the state. So the world updates the state, the state uses the logic, and how do we get a rendering done if we don't have access to the state? We take a value of the state, a value is sort of a closure concept. The best way to explain it is, I am 30 years old, I like beer. I am 31 years old, I like Coke. I, I don't know. I am 32 years old and I like pizza. Okay? These are all three different states that I can be in. And a value is, if you step back, saying, oh, at that point in time, I take a value and that value says, I like Coke. Now, in this example, you can take that value of I like Coke and you can render it. So a value is a snapshot in time, which the rendering engine then just renders. Now think about the possibilities of that being your reality. It means for you to test your rendering to test your UI, to look at what your UI looks like. All you need to do is give it a value. And what is a value? A data structure. You say, here is the data, go render. No setup, no life cycle, no nothing. Just here is the data, go render it. Do you know how much easier that makes? Well, think about it. Okay. Want to see some code? This is closure script code. So let's see where this goes. Okay. This is logic. The logic has the ability to move a board from square to square. Now that's quite interesting. The move needs an actual state. What does the board look like? 
and what do you move, want to move from and what do you want to move to. Okay? Rendering is that. That's it. Four lines, oh, four methods. It just says, board, give me a board, give me an owner, which is where I need to be in the DOM. Not exactly, but doesn't matter. And then draws a table with TRs and TDs. And you can test that by just giving it a data structure and say go. And there, here we have some state management. The state management is where we start thinking about time. In Closer, you can usually pick up state management by the words reset and swap, which and things like at app state. At app state takes a value. Now, we have a move exclamation mark there. We use it the same way as you use a Ruby destructive update, as in move exclamation mark actually changes time, actually changes state. And then we have a bit of world interaction. Uh, not enough time. There's this awesome thing in Closure Script, in Closure called core.async. Have you seen Go channels? Who has seen Go channels? So it's a re-implementation of Go channels into Closure ultimately into Closure Script, which means you now have CSP or Go channels in your browser. Take a moment to think what that means. <coughs> okay? Right. And uh, here's how I play with history. And some. Let's do this one first. Hello. Oh, there you are. Keep this picture in mind about the world state logic because that's exactly what this code looks like. And let's just get back to that guy. And then, right. So the first thing to note, that's the starting board. Uh, it's a multi-array of BR for Black Rook and then Black Knight and Black Bishop. Uh, then I can change the starting board using move AA to B8. So all this does is it takes that data structure above and it changes it by moving the BB to the third one. Okay? Nothing has actually changed. <coughs> This is still pure data being turned into pure data. Now I have this world channel, this thing that says this is the world, and if you throw things in there, it will change the actual state. And this is closure script for that, which says into the world, throw move E2 to E4. Now watch the actual chessboard. Moves it. Another nice thing to note, I haven't restarted this IDE or this browser for two weeks. I haven't refreshed that page for about two days. Because this is closure script and because we're using with, working with immutable data structures, it makes it so easy to just reset the state and do it again, which is what I will do now. I will say reset. And then move it again, reset. And now let's play an actual chess game. This is a chess game between Gary Kasparov and some other guy which I've never heard of before, which basically says, here's your list of moves, and then replay that game in the world using all those moves. Okay? So we're playing, I think it's about 100, we'll see very soon. Uh, watch the chessboard. Bam. What we've just done is every single move caused an application state change and every single move was recorded as part of the history and every single move did not cause a redraw. It was only when the browser felt like re-rendering that you actually re-rendered. So how many moves was that? 88. So that's about 88 slides. And just to show you that I didn't specifically cheat, 
Uh, let's play the long one out. That plays every single app state over time and just changes the state and say render, render, render. Now think about the power of that. If you could keep history of the state in which your UI was, and that person says, can I just go back to where I was? And this is exceedingly cheap. The implementation for this took absolutely no brain power. It was in an array, throw all the states, done. I'm going to cycle through all the states again. And you need to notice how quickly that happens again. So I'm going through all 88 states. Oops, what just happened? Okay, that's the end position. So I can do that, and then I can cycle to all the states. Okay? Now, because I have access to all the states, I can actually ask the question, show me move 70. And then show me move 87. I think that's pretty freaking awesome. And because the app state is something I can take a value of, I can ask the question, what does the board look like right now? Imagine this power of actually asking that question, what does my data structure look like right now? Seeing why it's not right, going back in time, inspecting it again, going forward in time, inspecting it again. What can you not do with all of this? That every single time somebody says, can we just get history on this item in the UI? I cry, because no, you can't, sorry. Now, with what Robert was on about with Atomic as a database, and having these, these, I was this today, I'm this now, and I'm that the next moment. If you have that as your underlying data model and you have this on top of that, you're now completely in sync in terms of your ability to play back history. Okay, any questions? Uh, yeah. <coughs> We blame the Facebook developers. <laughs> this, 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 no, 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 this is actually what makes it so freaking awesome. If you look at that dividing line, right, what it says is, if on the right, if the machine figures out how to do things faster, you need to do nothing. Any optimizations they do in 0 0.9, 1 1.0, 1 1.1, you get for free. And do go read the architecture, they have wonderful smart things. And yes, you can f figure out a very nice brute force way to always get it right. You will always get it right. How to do it fast is the next question. And closure script, immutable data structures makes that too easy. Like all the optimizations the JavaScript guys have to think about, the closure script guys just give you for free. Any other questions? So thank you to that guy. The uh, chessboard's not something I drew. He drew it in CSS3. He needs a life. I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Twitter handle, and let's have coffee. Cool. <laughs>
Electro por la vida.